Angela, thank you for joining us again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, Kate. Um, congratulations. I'm so excited <laughs> for you, your team, Marcus. Um, so let's, we'll throw it back to that day. Um, I know it's a lot of buildup. It's a lot of work that goes into it. What were you feeling like waking up that morning? Uh, to be honest, the few weeks leading up to the race are kind of a grind. <laughs> they wear you down because you're at the speedway so much. And then race day is so early. So I think I was up at like 345 to get to the track. And I was like, oh, thank goodness it's finally race day. Because that's, that's my element. I was, you know, I like race day. The rest of it's kind of just gravy. <laughs> <laughs> So did anyone say anything, you know, leading up to it? I know your dad's been influential on you. Did your parents say anything? Did any other, you know, engineers or, you know, crew say anything to you that really stuck with you before the race? I think most people know better than to say anything like leading. <laughs> um, most people just say good luck. <laughs> and uh um, I think the part that stuck with me was that like all five of our CGR cars were so fast throughout the entire time we were at Indy, especially during qualifying. Um, four of our five were in the fast six, which was a really big deal. Um, so our cars just had a lot of speed, and I know the rest of the paddock was impressed with what we had done as a group. So that was... That part of that is like really special, something I'm holding on to. Yeah, what was it like when um, Chip Ganassi, you know, racing had these super fast cars? Like you said, that's pretty um, unheard of to have four cars in the fast six at qualifying. It puts a lot of pressure on um, because you know that your car is capable of winning and that you're expected to win or at least contend for a win. Um, but it also makes you feel kind of good because you know you have a car that can and should win. So um, I've been on the other side of it where I kind of knew the p potential of my car was maybe like, oh, you know, if I do everything right today, I can maybe finish 10th. And that is demoralizing and <laughs> kind of kicks you down. So it's, it's really nice going into the race thinking like, man, I've got a really good shot to win this. Don't screw it up. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I know you've talked about you love the pomp and circumstance of the actual race day. Did you have a favorite memory in all of the, the pre-ceremony Indy 500 activities? Man, I really loved the flyover. It just, I don't know. That that part in particular, and I don't, I'm not sure why exactly, but it really stuck with me this year. Um, I was on the timing stand and the rest of the team was out on the starting grid. Uh, so I walked out kind of onto pit lane and the planes came over like directly overhead and I remember looking up and seeing this V flight pattern thinking like, man, that's really cool. I'm really, really lucky to be where I'm standing right now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I bet that was an awesome feeling. And then to top it off, you know, you, you won that day, but Talk me through what was going through your mind those last maybe five laps. Did you know Marcus had a chance at winning? Like, what was the whole team? What was that that feeling like? Well, earlier in the race, based on where we were running, um, I kind of thought, well, we're going to end up around seventh if things kind of stay status quo. And I was fairly happy with that. That's a good result, good point stay. And then as we were getting closer to the end, a few other cars had issues and we were coming to the last pit stop. And I remember thinking, man, we're going to cycle through here to like third or better if we jump someone on the stop. And as we came through the pit cycle, I'm like, oh my God, we're going to come out in the lead here. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, and then with five to go, so we're leading. And I just remember thinking like, what? is going to happen that's going to take this one away from me because I just remember thinking like something's gonna happen and we're gonna get screwed out of a win <laughs> I just I couldn't I kept thinking over and over like don't get too excited so, something's gonna happen it's like this isn't real and sure enough we had a red flag with uh, a couple laps to go and I just thought well 
there it goes. Because we had a three second lead. We were basically just walking away with it. Um, and then now we have to restart after a red flag. I'm worried about my electronics overheating while we're sitting there on pit lane. Like, is everything gonna boot back up the way that it should? And then on top of that, you know, is Marcus gonna be able to defend his position on the restart? And so that was nerve wracking. And I don't even think I believed that it was really gonna happen until after the checkered flag flew. And I remember because Chip was sitting to my left and our other engineer, Brad, was sitting to my right. And we took the checkered flag and I kind of just looked, and I looked over at Chip, I was like, Holy cow! We just won the Indy 500. <laughs> was everyone in disbelief, or what was? Were half of you like, you know, cheering and and freaking out, and half of you were still kind of stunned? Uh, I I think it was like 75 percent were freaking out, excited, okay. and a few of us were still like, "Holy cow! Did that just really happen?" <laughs> oh my gosh! What what was going? you know were people talking before during the restart or was it just kind of like really serious silence because you only had a couple laps left it was it was really serious but there was i was on the radio to our crew chief telling him the sequence for you know what needed to stay powered up we needed to get fans on you know x y and z um please don't turn the car off <laughs> and, um, and kind of just talking him through like what needed to happen at the car. Um, our strategist, Mike O'Gara was on the radio with Marcus, um, basically just trying to keep him calm, uh, get him refocused on uh, restarting the race and thinking about how he was going to defend his position. And uh, between those two things that took up all the available time. Sure. So can you walk us through a little bit, you know, I know you've talked about a lot of it's, you know, with some races, it's luck. And if, if there's a yellow flag or, you know, if the fuel strategy didn't work out, and especially with the Indy 500 with the fuel, what what was the kind of mixture for the success between, you know, Marcus's driving you know, the fuel strategy and the car itself and, and your teams kind of work on all of that? Well, I think part of what really helped us was our running position earlier in the race because we were um, back in the pack a little bit and your fuel mileage is extremely dependent on where you're at in the field. So if you're out leading, you're getting considerably worse fuel mileage uh, than if you were running like seventh or eighth like we were. Um, or even, you know, third or fourth, that first person line really takes a big hit on the fuel mileage. And that kind of stacks up during the race. And so Marcus is a smart driver and he's um, really got his head in the game all the time. So, you know, if he wasn't passing anyone or he, he knew he couldn't get by them because of, you know, the, the air wash on his car, he was saving fuel all the time during the race. So at the end of the race, what that means is you don't have to put as much fuel in the car, which means that you can take a shorter pit stop and only put in just enough fuel to get to the end. You don't have to fill it all the way up. So that was definitely something fuel wise that helped us win. Um, part of it's just luck of circumstance. Um, and the other part is just being prepared to take advantage of the circumstances. How much of it do you think, you know, I. I believe he uh, qualified and started in position four, Marcus did. Um, what, you know, ideally do you want to start in P1 at the Indy 500 or was his position kind of a sweet spot depending on that fuel strategy that you talked about? Well, ideally you're on pole. Um, one, it pays a big bonus, which is nice. <laughs> uh, and you can, you can always choose to fall back if you want. It's just a risk if you can, uh, you know, if you can get back up there. And you also have, the person behind you has to be willing to take that position. So you may slow down, but the person behind you may also slow down to avoid taking the lead for fuel purposes. Um, so 
I mean, ideally you have the poll, but in this case, I think it probably worked to our advantage that we didn't. Sure. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. So Marcus wins, the checkered flags out. What happens next? There's a lot of high-fiving in the pit box. Um, so a short celebration there. And then, so we were all the way at the front of pit lane. And so most of us just took off. I took off running like as fast as I could down pit lane. And I was just thinking, so my, my husband, Craig, works for the 60 team as an engine calibrator. And so I was just thinking, oh my God, I, like, I have to see Craig. You're like, I can't believe we just did this. <laughs> and so I took off running thinking, I don't know why, that like I should have been running to victory lane, but I was running to get to his pit box so I could see him. And I actually momentarily ran past victory lane and I was like, wait a minute, I'm here. <laughs> so... <laughs> So uh, we all ran down to Victory Lane, and uh, by the time I got there, the car, you know, had just pulled in. And so, um, you know, we we greeted Marcus as he got out of the car, and high fives all around, and hugs, and all of that. Was Marcus kind of in, in disbelief, or did he fully know that he just won the Indy 500? Had it sunk in yet, you think? Uh, it still may not have. Um, it's just, it's such a big deal to win that race that yes. I'm not sure that, uh, that you even really appreciate it or like believe that it happened until long after it's happened. Sure. Okay. So you, first thing you had to, you had to see your husband. Is there anyone else that you yeah. called or, or contacted after the race? <laughs> Um, so my sister-in-law and my father-in-law were there, and so that was really cool that I got to, um, you know, give them hugs after, you know, we went up to, uh, the, the victory circle at Indy Motor Speedway is really cool because it's raised up, so you go up an elevator, or you go on the stairs up behind, so you're on this big platform, and we took pictures and all that stuff, and then, um, on the way back down, they were standing in this, like, sea of people waiting to tell me congratulations, so that was really cool that I got to celebrate with them, and then, um, I think my first text, I had a selfie with Marcus with the Borg Warner Trophy, and I texted that to my dad and my brother <laughs> because they were kind of the, the people in my family growing up that we bonded over racing. And that's kind of what really started my passion for motorsports. So they were the first people that weren't there that I shared with. Amazing. That's awesome. OK, so what was Victory Lane like? You know, you've won other races, but what was it like? after winning the Indy 500. So yeah, the victory circle at Indy is a totally different experience. It's way bigger. There's tons of people there. Um, normally it's just like spray champagne. Everybody gets a swig, you take a picture and, you know, celebrate a little bit. And then, you know, you head back to your time, you stand and tear down and get ready to go. Um, Indy is like, I was prepared to be in victory lane all night if, <laughs> if they would allow us. Um, it's an extended celebration. And one of the really cool things were just how many fans had come to that area to celebrate with you. And um, there were a few like younger girls that were standing along the staircase and you know I gave them a high five on the way down and I just thought that was really cool and um so somebody in the in the mass of people offered me a beer which that was funny and uh <laughs> did you accept or no <laughs> it's just uh I I may have I may have <laughs> I love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> So it, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a much bigger celebration. Okay. Okay. And it, was your family, was your um, father-in-law and sister-in-law and your husband able to come into Victory Lane with you or how, or were they watching you? Uh, so my husband, Craig did, um, I don't know how he got up there, but he found his way up there <laughs> and he came <laughs> He came up and gave me a big hug, and that was really awesome. So, yeah, he was up, up in Victory Lane with me, and we took a few pictures together, and, yeah, that was really cool. So I didn't get to see um, 
my extended family until you know after after we had finished with a lot of the photos and stuff and had drank our milk but um yeah that was really cool that he was able to get up there and celebrate with me just like right after yeah. it happened and remind me so what is his role with with an indy car and, and the indy 500 so Craig is an engine calibrator and he works for um, HPD and uh, so he's assigned to the 60 team and he works, you know, he travels the same schedule I do um, and just kind of, he works on engine calibration and I work on, you know, um, the data systems, so. Okay, okay. Awesome. Okay, so... There's been a lot of different articles. You're you're all over when I Google you now. <laughs> but you made history as the first female crew member to win the Indy 500 within the Indy car. Like, I mean, what does that mean to you? That's that's amazing. Somebody had asked me that um, in Victory Lane actually, and they're like, "Are you so? Are you the first woman to do this?" I, and I was like. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm really not sure. Uh, and actually, um, Marshall Pruitt, who uh, does a lot of motorsports writing, um, he did a lot of the background research and got in touch with some um, Indy Motor Speedway historians and um, basically like tracked down uh, this this fact finding mission to see if I was or wasn't, and, and it turned out that. Um, as far as they know that I, that I am. And I, I thought that was really cool. Um, part of what made that so special was that when I was in NASCAR, which is what I dreamed about doing as a, as a kid, um, my goal was to be the first female crew chief in NASCAR. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to be. And it was really important to me to, to be the first one. Um, and a few years ago when I decided to leave NASCAR, um, I kind of had to give up on that dream because, you know, if I wasn't going to be in NASCAR, then, you know, I couldn't be the first female crew chief, obviously. So um, I think this is an adequate replacement, more than adequate replacement for, for that goal of mine and something that... Um, I can hang on to as, you know, I, I still was able to achieve something in my field that no other woman had done yet. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And it's so funny because I remember I talked to Marcus um, at a test day at IMS. That was really cool. I've obviously spoken to you a couple times and you guys just kept saying the Indy 500 is the pinnacle. Like, of course, this is like the yes. biggest dream of ours. And then it happened. And I, it's just so amazing to see that. Um, and I'm sure you guys just had, of course, the best day. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, so, you know, Chips, Ch Chip sets these goals for us. And we talk about them every week uh, in our pre-race meeting. You know, we have two goals for the season. Number one is in, win the Indy 500. And in some respects, that's an even bigger goal than winning the championship. And goal number two, which I just alluded to, is to win the championship. Um, and every single week we talk about those. Um, so it's obviously a difficult thing to do um, to win either of those. So it was, yeah, it's a big achievement to, to be able to do it. Yeah. And so right now we're talking, it's mid-June. Marcus just came in second at Road America. He's leading in the points in the series. What what would that mean to you? Is that is it has there been other I'm sure there's been other drivers, but who have won both and you know, that's got to be a huge milestone to, you know, win the Indy 500 and the series, I assume. <laughs> uh actually, I was reading something at lunch and I I think and I may be mistaken, but I think that it's only been done two other times in recent history, and both of them have been Chip Ganassi Racing drivers, um, Scott Dixon and Dario Franchitti in 2008 and 2010. So um, it's been done, but not recently, and uh, it's a pretty huge deal if you can check both off, on, you know, especially one season. Absolutely. 
And when we talk about other Chip Ganassi drivers, you know, obviously there's competition. Everyone's competitive. This is, you know, a professional sport. But what is it like, you know, are the teammates happy that, that Marcus won? I'm sure that everyone wants to win it, but what is it like within that culture of Chip Ganassi racing? You know, we really take the one team mentality to heart. And I think that's something that um, the people of CGR do really well and what makes us so competitive because um, we're all pushing in the same direction and not, you know, obviously we're all competing against one another, but we're not hiding anything from one another either. Um, so, you know, I think one of the, one of the things at the 500 was, you know, Alex was lead, leading early in the race and uh, he caught a yellow at the exact wrong time and had to take emergency fuel and then go to the back of the field. That basically took him out of contention. And Scott Dixon was right there at the front of the field to take his spot when, you know, when he caught some bad luck. And then late in the race, after Scott had led most of the race and was on a good path to victory, um, couldn't get slowed down enough and sped on pit lane. And so same thing, then now he's got a penalty. He goes, you know, basically to the back of the field. And, you know, there's another CGR car there that's just as fast, that's ready to take that spot and carry the torch for the team. So, you know, if, if one car can't do it, we want the next car to do it. And if that car can't do it, the next car is right there ready to do it. Um, so we're all always backing each other up. And um, it was one of the really nice things. I know it was really heartbreaking for Scott because um, he had led so much of the race and, you know, his car was obviously really fast. And, you know, he came to victory lane and congratulated Marcus. And I know that it was really heartfelt congratulations because he knows from his own experience, what a big deal it is to win that race. So um, we're competitive, but we're still a family. Yeah, I love that. I think that's really unique with you guys too, because I can tell just from articles I've read and, and things I've seen on social media, I think that's that's awesome. What does all this support mean to you, you know, from your husband, who's a fellow Boilermaker, your parents, your family? How does that um, kind of fuel fuel you for the next race and, you know, as you keep going in your career? Um, well, obviously, I you know, I can't work in a vacuum and, um, you know, I have, especially my husband, I you know, when I decided that I really wanted to be in racing, you know, we picked up, we both picked up our lives and he left his career uh, at Chrysler so that I could go and pursue my dream. And that's not a trivial thing that he did for me. Um, and when I decided that I wanted to leave NASCAR and come do IndyCar, we picked up our lives a second time. And, you know, that was not a trivial thing for him to do now twice. Um, I have a lot of late nights, long days that, you know, um, I'm away from home a lot and I work really long hours and, you know, he always is picking up the slack for me. And so, yeah, I couldn't do it without him, frankly, because that's <laughs> you, you have to have a support system. And, you know, he's he's right behind me and he totally supports the racing lifestyle because he's got the racing bug, too. So, you know, um, hopefully he feels the same for me, you know, when he gets really busy and needs, you know, extra time or has a test or whatever. I try and pick up the slack on the other end. Yeah, absolutely. That's really special. What was it like seeing yourself in Purdue's Indy 500 commercial? <laughs> um, I didn't. I don't know if I realized that I was going to be in it, and I started watching it, and I was like, "Oh, how cool! That is so awesome!" So um, I was surprised, but happily surprised, and. Uh, yeah, the commercial gave me all the feels because oh, just the music in the background and all the sights and sounds like of Indy Motor Speedway and that place is just so special and all these little things that make it special. It's like Purdue's really ingrained in all those things. So I'm just honored to even be, you know, a part of that, even if it's a small part, but you know, I'm honored to represent my school. 
Absolutely. No, it's not a small part. It's a big part. <laughs> <laughs> um, did any other Boilermakers reach out to you after your win? You know, did our, I hope our podcast helped show the world <laughs> that a Boilermaker won the Indy 500 too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got, I got an inordinate number of messages um, after the race and I am still struggling to respond to them all. Uh, even in June, uh, a lot of people did reach out and just say, you know, congratulations. A lot of old classmates who I hadn't talked to in a long time um, reached out and said like, oh my gosh, I think that's so cool. I remember you being so into motorsports even when we were at Purdue together. And so, yeah, it was it was really cool to connect with some people from from my past and some people, honestly, that I had never met um that are just you know part of the purdue family and wanted to reach out and congratulate me and felt like they were part of the win because of that tie that was really cool that's awesome we love hearing that um okay last question are we you know we touched on the women in motorsports program um with pnc bank and chip ganacity racing uh, I saw there's a purdue officially a, a purdue um student working within this um, initiative. Yeah. Have you gotten to work with her at all? Tell us a little bit about how that's going. Um, yeah, so we have, I think, five five interns, and um, one of them is from Purdue. And uh, so they've been um, at the track with us um, since Indy, I guess. Indy was the, uh, the first event that they got to, you know, start getting integrated with our team. So, um, Man, they probably came in and thought, wow, it's like pretty easy to win. <laughs> like first try, I came in and like here, here you are, victory lane. <laughs> um, I'm hoping I am impressing on them how difficult it is and um, setting a good example for work ethic and the amount of attention to detail that it really takes to, to get the job done. Um, but it's, it's cool to see some other people uh, getting their foot in the door and just starting out their career where, you know, um, they're seeing things for the first time that uh, is maybe not as novel to me anymore. It's kind of fun to see that through a different pair of eyes. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Well, we can't thank you enough for sharing sharing this update with us and, and sharing your experience with us again. So we're rooting for you and Marcus and the number eight team for sure. Thanks. Yeah, we've got nine races to go in the season and um, maybe we'll talk again in October with a championship under my belt, hopefully. Yes, next Giant Leap championship. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, Angela. All right, thanks. Thanks.